All right, this morning, interesting top topic, kingdom sexuality. But first I want to read you a quote from John Wesley. Obviously John Wesley had a, a long ministry, brought hundreds of thousands to the Lord. But he said something that caught my eye. He said, before I can preach love mercy, and grace, I must preach sin, law, and judgment. Let me say that again. Before I can preach love, mercy, and grace, I must preach sin, law, and judgment. Because for a person to truly become repentant, which means turning the direction of your life, walking a different way, Not just being sorry for your sins, but actually uh, turning from them, living a different lifestyle. You have to know what God's standards are, what His laws and His standard of righteousness is. So we're going to look at this subject today called uh, Kingdom Sexuality, or we could just boil it down to God's Purpose for Sex. And I don't think there's any subject that would get you or get us in more trouble. Uh, In fact, with some, this would be considered hate speech. And because of that, many churches have already begun to compromise the truth of God's Word because there's so much pressure coming. In fact, in some nations like uh, our neighbor to the north, Canada, United Kingdom, they've already have put pastors in jail for just reading the Word of God and standing for what the Word of God says regarding this issue. So there's probably no other subject that will get us persecution more than this subject. But it's something we have to know, we have to know what His Word says, and we have to stand by His Word. And it's not a matter of my opinion or your opinion. The only opinion that counts is his opinion, right? All right, so think about this. God is the one who created sex, okay? He created, and just like everything else he created, he said, it is good. It's a good thing, okay? Now, Satan has never created anything. All Satan can do is to pervert or twist the truth of God's Word. I mean, it actually comes down to the the original lie. Did God really say? I mean, it all comes to that. It comes back to to the enemy coming and saying, well, did God really say? Come on, get with it. This is, you know, 2022. Things have changed. Cultures change. No, God really did say. But that's the lie that comes. So I want to start out in Genesis 1 and verse 26 through 28. And it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in numbers. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So God said, I created them male and female, two genders, not five, not six genders, two genders. All right? Now, when I was growing up, 
I had a lot of girlfriends. Am I getting a lot of, yeah, not, now, let, let me restate that. <clears throat> yeah, uh, woo, yeah. I did have a lot of uh, friends who were girls, okay? They were tomboys, okay? So these tomboys like to do what I like to do. They used to play football with us, do the same things that we did. They played sports and great, you know, we had great fun together. But as I grew older and they went through puberty with all the changes that goes on, you know, with that. But later as I got older in high school and, and uh, some went to college, they all ended up getting married, having children, having grandchildren, and some of them even have great-grandchildren now. And you know what one of them told me? Said, I'm sure, you know, prepare for this, I'm sure glad this transgender crap wasn't around when I was going through my tomboy phase because it would have ruined my life. And I thought, wow, how, how true. And so all these tomboys that were my friends, they grew up, and they got married. And they were fruitful, and they multiplied, right? So the LGBTQ uh, lobby, we could call it, has been grooming transgenders uh, to our children for, for quite some time now. But if you go back, uh, it wasn't until 2013. So that's not that long ago. But every culture in history identified two genders, male and female. Now, in 2013, the LGBTQ plus lobbied the American Psychiatric Association into changing gender identity disorder from a mental disorder into something normal. So, in other words, before, when it was considered a, uh, a gender identif- uh, identity disorder, it would be like something, just like they would treat it, someone with depression or anxiety or any number of other long list of disorders, they would give counseling, they would give help. But after that point, they said, no, we're not doing that anymore. From now on, this is normal. Even though, through all the human history before, no, it was not. And it's interesting that, you know, like in a, in a male, take virtually all the 30 to 40 trillion cells, because we're going to talk about science, in an adult male is permanently encoded with the XY chromosome. So it's the same way, male and female, permanently encoded in their every cell of their body. Now, one thing we're coming to recognize now is that the suicide rate in the transgender community is the highest of any subset of people. Now, the reason is not because they're persecuted. In fact, it's just the opposite. They are celebrated, and they become instant heroes on social media. And so they are elevated, and it becomes almost a pressure for you to move in that direction. And so there's a tremendous amount of pressure being put on our youth this day, in this age, that was never, there, that we never even thought about. And I, I can imagine talking to those tomboys back in those days. They would, you know, I, I think you're not really, I think you're really a, a male trapped into that female body. And they would have said, what have you been smoking? You know? <laughs> but that's the difference. And this change has occurred so rapidly. Okay, Genesis 2 and verse 24 It says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. So a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. So that is what God's plan is for sex between a man and a woman 
in the covenant of marriage. So it's not just homosexual activity we're talking about. We're talking about anything outside of marriage, whether that's adultery, someone cheating on their spouse, whether that's pornography. There's so many different things. But it's met, and, and God has made that not to keep us from, from pleasure or not to keep us back, but he's actually made that because it's protective. There's a protective place within that marriage of a man and a woman in a holy covenant. And it's not that God's sitting there with a hammer waiting for you to step out of line and go, boom. No. We have sexual trans- transmittable disease. We have, now we have monkeypox. HIV, all these things, they're out there. So, so God has set this place of safety. And if we step out of it, it's not that he's using a hammer. He's just saying, this is what's already going on in the natural world that I've created. And if you step out of it, you're in danger. And so there's safety within it. What also follows that when you step outside, because anything outside, again, of of that marriage covenant, which is sin, guilt, shame, regret follows him. And again, it's not that the Lord, the Lord is just trying to protect us. He's not trying to hold back our, our pleasure or enjoyment. That's the only way to find true joy. So another big issue, of course, right now is going on and has been for, for several years, well, quite a long time, especially the last decade or two, is the issue of, of uh, homosexuality. So I want to le- read a uh, verse out of the Old Testament, Old Covenant, and then I want to also read one out of the New Covenant so you can see it out of both, both covenants. So the first one is Leviticus 18.22, and I'll just read that one. It says, and do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. That is detestable, or some versions will say that's an abomination, okay? But let's go to, because some people say, well, that's Old Testament. So let's turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 24 through 27. I can find it. So Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. It says, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Now they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who was forever praised. Amen. And because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women, and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committing indecent acts with other men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. So what's that penalty? Again, we have things like monkeypox right now, which is almost totally homosexual, or those who are associated with homosexuals, But we forget sometimes about AIDS and HIV, which has killed over 700,000 people have died from that. And so, again, it's like the Lord has made this bubble. He's made this great gift, but it's to be used between a man and woman, again, in that covenant of marriage. There's protection in it. But if you step out of that... You're putting yourself in danger. All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 
Now, the church at Corinth, uh, Corinth was known for its uh, immorality. I mean, everything went there. Whether it's homosexuality, bestiality, uh, they had uh, temple prostitutes who were both male and female. I mean, everything went. There was no, anything you can imagine, they did in that city, okay? So Paul is writing this letter to the Corinthians, and we're going to start in verse 9. And he said, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Okay, what's, what's he mean, do not be deceived? Well, in the culture, again, as I mentioned, this was normal. All those things, the orgies, the homosexuality, everything was considered normal in their culture. So when he said, don't let somebody lie to you and say, well, I'm just, this is who I am, or it's okay, I can still love God and still be this way. He said, no, do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slandered, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, people who, that is their lifestyle. It's not somebody who's struggling and, and they fell into sin and they've repented. He's talking about people who are boldly living that way. That is the practice of their life. But here's the good news, verse 11. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So, yeah, we have these homosexuals, we have people who are adulterers, all coming into the church now, but they have been washed clean. You know, the, the Word says that He removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. Though our sins be as scarlet, He makes us white as snow. So, yeah, they came in with that, but they repented, they turned to the Lord, and they, their, their slate was wiped clean. So that is the good news of the gospel. Okay? Now, if you drop on down that same chapter, down to verse 18, it says, flee from sexual immorality. Or another, some verses will say, run from sexual immorality. Why? Because all other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So it says, flee from sexual immorality. Find yourself getting in a situation where that temptation is there, run. Don't play around with it. Don't mess around. Turn immediately and go the other direction. Because we can all be tempted. But God says, the Scripture says God will allow a way of escape. Now, another thing going on right now, of course, is the drag queen story time, okay? That's happening in libraries, it's happening in some schools, even it happening in some churches, okay? Where homosexual men, of course, dress up in their dresses and lipsticks and all, everything, and the whole, and, and they're teaching children who are, who can't even read yet. That's why they're in story time, because they want to infiltrate and they want to begin to get the various young and make these things seem normal. Now, I'm just going to read a scripture in Deuteronomy 22.5. It says, a woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear a woman's clothing. 
For the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. So it's all part of a plan being pushed on our youngest children to turn things. Again, the enemy comes to twist, to pervert what God has made. Now, chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, since we're close there, I want to read the first 13 verses there. And it says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that does not occur even among the pagans. A man has his father's wife, and you are proud. Okay, so what's going on there? So we have somebody who is in obvious sin, having his father's wife in adultery. Everybody in the church knows it. And he says, you guys are, are proud. You're, you're boasting. In other words, they were saying, aren't we tolerant? Aren't we forgiving? Aren't we loving? And we're not judgmental, okay? And so Paul has to address this. Again, he says, and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit. And I've already passed judgment on the one who did this just as if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed, and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast Work through the whole batch of dough. Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. Now, here's something coming, verse 9, very important. I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexual immoral people, not at all meaning the people of the world who are immoral or greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother but is sexual immoral or a greedy, or an idolater, or a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. So we have a case where Paul tells the church they need to have church discipline. They have somebody who, professing to be a Christian, who is sitting in their fellowship, but is blatantly, openly living in sin. And so he confronts them and says, you guys are boasting because you think you're so, you know, you're so loving. You are, you know, you're not judgmental. And he says, no, don't you realize you should be grieved And you should put the man out of the fellowship so that his soul may be saved because of him being put out. So that's something we don't see a lot anymore, but it's something we have to stand by. All right, what 1 Thessalonians, all your T's are together back there. And we're going to look at Chapter 4, and 1 through 8. 
And Paul says, finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to, the, to do this more and more. For you know the instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen, who do not know God, and that in this manner no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sin, as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject who he rejects his instruction does not reject man, but God, who gave you his Holy Spirit. So Paul is just affirming this is not a, a matter of opinion, what I think or what you think. This is a matter of what the, the Word of God says. And we have to stand, again, by the Word of God. I'm not going to turn there, but uh, all of this kind of adds up to something, because in Psalms 2, it's a, it's a prophetic song, uh, and what it says is, it's, it, it says the nations and the kings and the, the people rebel against the Lord, and they say, let us break the chains and the fetters that are holding us back. In other words, you have no right to tell me what I can do. I mean, there comes this place where Whatever I want to do, I should be able to do. I should have that freedom. I want to break those chains. But the Lord's word is very clear, and he stands where our sexuality is to be, and it's to be used in that, again, in that covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. Now, that's some of the, the negative things. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the positive so, think back into the garden, and the Lord says, it's not good for man to be alone. So, he takes Adam, he puts him to sleep, and he takes a rib, and he makes Eve. Okay, so, so when uh, Adam wakes up, and he looks, and he sees Eve... He goes, whoa, hubba, hubba, you know? <clears throat> this is a good thing. Lord, you've made some good things before, but you just, this is like, this is the cream on top of the Sunday or something here. I mean, this is great, you know? And so he made this, especially for, for Adam. And so, again, this is a good thing. It's not a negative. It is, sex is a great thing, Okay. In fact, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verses 1 through 5. And he's talking about marriage here. He says, Now for the matter you wrote me about, it is good for a man not to marry. Now, for Paul, he was not married. He was a celibate, and he had dedicated his life to the Lord but he goes on later and says, you know, that's a gift that God has given me. I don't have that gift. Well, a lot of us in here don't have that gift, okay? So it's good for us to be married. But since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman his own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and we're talking about sex here, just to be clear. And likewise, the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Verse 5, do not deprive each other except by mutual consent 
and for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So what he's saying there, too, is you don't use sex as a weapon. Well, I'll teach them. I'll teach my spouse. No, you come, you only do that as you're setting apart a time for fasting and prayer. Otherwise, you are, we are encouraged. We are encouraged. Have sex. You know, you don't hear that a lot from the pulpit. You are now. It's a good thing. And I'll read you a little mushy stuff. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18 to 21. And it says, May your fountain be blessed. And may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. And if you go into like the song of Solomon, it's got all sorts of mushy, gushy stuff in there about her breast being like this and that, and her belly's a, a you know, you know, her eyes, you know, have all this, all these different descriptive things in there. So the point is that, that sex is a beautiful gift that the Lord has given us, but it's to be enjoyed between a man and a woman in that place, in that safety of that covenant of marriage. And the Lord blessed it, and he said, it is good. It's a good thing. But that does bring some questions up. Okay, so what do we do when someone comes in to our fellowship, and let's say they're homosexual, active homosexual, they're uh, married, but they're, you know, say the guy is cheating on his wife, living in, in adultery, whatever it may be, a transgender, whatever, how do we, what do we do? Well, we, we love them. We, we welcome them. But at the same time, we always have to speak the truth in love. And eventually there comes a time where we'll have to face that and say, you know, there comes a place where either you repent and turn to the Lord, and we'll help you, we'll pray for you, we'll help counsel you, we'll help you along the journey, but there has to be a change. And I don't know what the time frame of that would be. It would probably depend on each individual. But there are some things that happen. You know, some people say, well, you know, I have a um, same-sex attraction. Well, that's really no different than a heterosexual having attraction for someone who's not his wife. There are both issues that we have to deal with. There are both issues that we have to stand on the Word of God. There are temptations out there, but if, but God is faithful, and if we are willing, and even someone who's, again, struggling, and maybe they're, they're trying to get out of it, but they're, they're falling back, we stay with them, we pray for them, we help them till they get the complete victory, and we, don't, we treat everyone with respect, Okay? But we also, again, it's that line, you have to stand by what the Word of God says. So, my encouragement for you today is that there's a reason God has has placed this. And and again, I I just want to emphasize the point that because some people feel like God's with a hammer, and He's going to hammer you as soon as you step out of line. But it's, again, it's a a matter of God has created creation. And within creation and within nature, there are certain things that happen that is bad news if you get outside of that will. And that's what's happened, whether it's AIDS, whether it's Michael, there's other things that are out there that aren't even here yet, that people, you know, it's going to be bad. 
but we have to stand for the truth of God's Word, and at the same time, love others, respect others, but love them too much, just like God does, to leave them as they are. Because all of us have issues. Many of us in here were some of those people. Many of us in here have come in with sin in our past life. And I'm one. But God was faithful to forgive. And as long as we have that repentant heart, turning to the Lord, he will forgive us. And again, as he removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. But again, there is so much temptation now that we never had to deal with when I was growing up. I think of pornography. You know, I had to sneak into a store, try to grab a magazine, no one's seeing me, but, you know, now it's all on your phone. It's on your computer. It's at your fingertips. And it's an addiction because you will never be satisfied. You will just continue to get, require more and more. More and more weirdness in order to satisfy. And that is also something that is running marriages. So we need to keep our eye gates clean, our ear gates clean. Watch what you watch. Because you become what you gaze upon. And if you're gazing upon that, you're going to become that. So again, I don't want to be totally negative, but I think we also, you know, as John Wesley said, we have to preach the word. We have to preach judgment. We have to preach their consequences. But it's also forgiveness, and there's a new life through Jesus, through the blood of Jesus. So let's go ahead and pray. I want to, have to take the time for anybody who wants prayer for whatever, any help with regarding that issue, or someone who needs prayer for healing, whatever the need may be. We want to have the opening up here, and have, we'll have some people up here to pray for you. So, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. And, Lord, I ask for the courage for this people, Lord, even though the pressure is coming Persecution is coming over this issue, and we have to stand strong. We have to speak the truth in love, but we have to speak the truth. So, Lord, we thank you that you gave us specific guidelines on how we are to live. And so, Lord, I ask that you would bless each one in here, Lord. And Lord, for anyone in here who is struggling in any of those areas, Lord, I ask that you would upgird them right now, Lord. That, Lord, you'd give them the strength that they need to say no. Lord, if someone needs to repent and turn from a lifestyle that is not pleasing to you, that you would give them that courage, Lord, to walk out what your desire is for them, Lord. And, Lord, just again to acknowledge that, Lord, you gave us this beautiful gift. And, Lord, we want to be faithful in using it as you have given it to us, Lord, in your love and your compassion to protect us, not to keep us from from anything. So, Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness. We thank you for your blessings in our life. And, Lord, we ask that we would have the right heart, that we'd have that gift of discernment, that as those begin to come in here who are living in those types of lifestyles, Lord, that we would have the anointing, that we have the wisdom to help them, Lord, line up their lives with the truth of your word, to love them, to help them, to pray for them, to counsel them. So, Lord, we we give you the praise, we give you the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.